and welcome to Coffee with Samantha Jane. I'm Samantha... No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm Fiona Scott. <laughs> I'm Samantha's older sister by another mother. And I thought it was about time we poked around into Sam's world. And we asked her those probing questions that we asked other people. So uh, the tables are turned on Samantha Scott today. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Right, Samantha Jane, mm. let's kick off. Yeah. When did you first notice that you can recall that you were a bit different from other children? I have been like it all my life, but believe it or not, it took me until I was 28 to realise that not everyone was in the same life experience as me. It literally took me to about 28 for the penny to drop that the reason why I have such bizarre conversations and this and that and the other and stuff going on is because not everyone is getting what you're getting, Sam. So yeah, I'm a bit of a late developer in that sense. I didn't, didn't click for a long time. <laughs> okay, then, so when, before mm. you were the extraordinary woman mm. you are now, what did you do for a living? I worked in recruitment. I worked in the licensed trade. I've owned pubs. I've worked in recruitment. And prior to that, I was actually a Montessori nanny and nursery school teacher. That seems quite a lot. If you look back over that, did you always sort of feel you didn't fit there? Yeah, nothing ever felt quite enough, as in, you know how we feel like something's missing in our lives. We can have that feeling. I always felt like that, although I always absolutely loved everything I ever did. Something wasn't quite there, is how I would describe it. Right, so let's go back to little Samantha Jane then. Yeah. What's your earliest memory of an experience that you now realise most kids don't have? I can remember a very small age, I used to always walk up and down the stairs and pass a man on the stairs and say hello to him. And that was it. All the time, all the time I would say that. I mean, I can remember writing poetry as a kid and writing, yesterday upon the stairs I met, uh, met a man who wasn't there. Um, I met him there again today. I wish that man would go away. I can remember writing that as a kid. <laughs> but I mean, that's a poem, but you meant it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm surprised no one clicked from the poem. <laughs> What was going on? Um, but yeah, things like that. I was the classic, terrified at night, bit like my youngest, head under the duvet, frightened to death, can't sleep with even a toe sticking out of the bedding. I've got to be completely cocooned. I used to, not now, but I used to have to be completely cocooned under bedding, totally aware of things going on around the bed and people coming in and out and so aware of all of that. But I used to hide. So just say, what, so the man on the stairs, could you see him? What did he look like? Did your parents know anything about that? Or yeah. your mum? You... Elderly man, um, shirt, trousers, just passing by all the time through the house, passing by is how I would describe him. Did Probably your parents 70s. pick? Did your parents pick up on anything? Not at that time. I'm, that was that's my strongest memory. And I I think my my dad was military. My mum was busy doing it all. When you, when your other half is off in the military, we just got on with everything. And you know what I mean? It's like you kind of just get busy. But I don't really recall ever talking about it as a child. I've got no memory, I might be wrong, but I, I don't actually have memory of talking about it as a child. It, I just, because I didn't question it. It just, well, this is my experience. That's how it was. Did you talk to any of your friends about it, you know, at primary school or secondary school? No, and the reason for that is because my mum then, though she's not now, my mum then was working as a medium outside of doing a day job and all the rest of it. So in my teenage years, I was really bullied um, about that because obviously I'm 50, so we're going back 40 years. It's a very different world 40 years ago to now when it comes to these things. So do you think then your gift was passed down through your family? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You can see the trail of it um, on my mum's side and on my dad's side as well. So it's, you know, and I've named my children after the last two, God, they're probably my great aunts or great, great aunts on my dad's side. Um, 
Yeah, they were, I come from a family of, you know, like, a bit like Doris Stokes, women in the back kitchen at the table, the women used to go and see, have a drink, she'd do the tea leaves and she'd do all that. That's, that's, that's my heritage. And then we, um, when we do the descendant line, we've got the Romany roots as well. So we've had the real fairground, crystal ball, tarot reading background as well, gypsy rose ball. But yeah, it's always been there, but it's always passed through the females in my family. And you've got two daughters. Yeah. Are you seeing any evidence this? Oh, from the day they were born. From, I don't think they have a choice. From the day they were born. Yasmin, my youngest, has always been the child under the duvet, the hiding one. Um, I have lots of memories of running down the, the hallway, jump into my bed at night and stuff like that. Whereas my eldest has been more accepting of it. She's the one you, I would hear in the bedroom shouting at the invisible friends to put her stuff back. Um, it's very like that. And she still does. She'll kill me for saying that, but she still does. <laughs> and tell us, when you were under the duvet, mm. um, you know, from a child's point of view, what was going on in your bedroom? Just close your eyes, close your eyes, don't look, don't look, don't look. And then, then eventually I'd fall asleep and it would be the morning. Can you remember before you actually thought, right, OK, I'm going to embrace this and I'm 28 and this mm. is going to be a big part of my life. Can you recall any other particular incidents before that, say in your 20s? Gosh, um, all sorts of looking back, living in houses and things like that, which is why I like to talk to people about that. Um, I, psychically, I've got memories of sitting in between family members having arguments or discussions and sitting there thinking, why are you saying that when blah, blah, blah? And it's, of course, that's because they don't know, blah, blah, blah. I'm the one sat there knowing, blah, blah, blah. So lots of situations like that in terms of around family members and things like that. But the real key moment of, not this isn't right, because that sounds wrong, but you know what I mean? Like, this isn't normal, I suppose is a better word was at the age of um, 28, having a pub in Bristol with a former landlord who'd passed, constantly goosing barmaids behind the bar. What on earth is goosing? What do you mean by that? Goosing, so the barmaids on a Sunday night would be cleaning the optics and it was back in the day where the optics were there and there was mirrors behind them so they, and we had to be open. Um, whether we had clients or not, we had to be open. And so the girls would do all the cleaning jobs on a Sunday night while I would have the night off. So they'd be cleaning optics, full mirror. In those mirrors, you could see the entire place. So you'd know if there was anyone around you. And they would literally have someone up their skirt and take a handful of backside and beyond. <laughs> Let's call it that to be disgusting. But yeah, and that they would phone me screaming and terrified and get down there, get down there. I used to go through so many barmaids. And in the end, with me being lost in the moment of it or not realising there was people sat in the pub, I can remember standing in the middle of the pub. And where this come from? Because I didn't even know any of this at this point. Standing in the middle of the pub saying, pack it in. If you do that again, I'll get rid of you. And you know I can. You know I know how to. It just come out like a rant. You know, when you then turn around and all these people are looking at you going, oh, 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 I have that moment. And that's when the penny dropped that I was living in a different world. And we used to have bands as well. So they'd go up to the flat and there was a point on the stairs and they'd all have this feeling as they went up the stairs and they'd all feel as they got dressed into their glam stuff to go down and sing, they'd all feel they were being watched. So I had a lot of stuff like that going on, but definitely 28 in a pub in Bristol was gay. <laughs> and when you, um, when you have got those gifts and you see the world differently to others and you suddenly decide, right, I'm going to embrace this, isn't that dangerous? Because couldn't you get someone to train you who doesn't know what they're doing? How do you find the right person, the right mentor, to help you with that. How did you do that? Well, I went to a couple of churches and asked for help, but I think they thought I was stepping in as a fake. And what I mean by that is I was presenting myself as no experience and yet already being able to give dush, 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 dush. And I think they thought I was just testing them. So I didn't get help. I'm actually spirit trained. So what that means is I basically sat every night with spirit 
because um, I said to him, if you want me to do this, you're going to have to show me how. So yeah, Spirit have taught me everything I know, whether it's, and then they do things like they steer me to a book, they steer me to a video, they steer me to this. But at the beginning, most definitely, they sat me down and told me how to open up, how to close, how to do this, how to do that, which I'm grateful for. And so of today then, who are the spirits that are helping you? You know me, I'm nosy. I right. want to know. <laughs> so I work with my um, great-great-grandmother Rose. Um, she was the tarot reader. So she comes through. If she comes in in a reading, I go, oh shit, internally, because she is so hard as nails, sort of roaming the energy. People think she's a Victorian when they pick her up. That I know she's about to seriously say it as it is and keep, she comes in when the person in front of me is going yeah yeah but they're not taking it in so i work with her i have chun who is my master healer guide a little chinese medicine man so when i need to do deep spiritual work he will i will literally hear him shuffle in um, and he will step in and do the work because i work as a trance healer he makes me laugh because he insists on wearing a white coat Chinese medicine men never had white coats. <laughs> He's more, he should really rack up in pyjamas, do you know what I mean? I then have um, a little boy, a Tibetan boy, who's a Tibetan monk, who, who does stand in orange pyjamas, who has the silver bowl. And everything I remove from my clients, if it's on the, this lifetime layer, gets put into that silver bowl. And he takes it away. He's silent, so I smile at him and he smiles at me because he's not allowed to speak. He's a silent monk, basically, but a child like they do. Um, so he comes in. I have, I work with all the ascended masters if I'm doing a massive. So that, and all of the angelic. So your ascended masters are like Buddha, uh, Jesus, um, Diana, um, Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, all of that level I work with on, on one level of stuff. And then I go to a whole other level when I'm doing the timeline work, the parallels, the quantums. And when I'm at that level, I'm working with what's called galactic or general word, alien. And that's what I work with. So I'm working at that point with what we'd call alien, but they call, they call us alien beings in another, God, what would you call it? An entire galaxy? Would that be the right word? A whole other level, a whole other plane. They come in to do that work with me. Are you glad you asked? Yeah, I'm going to go back. I'm asked. I, I am as confused as I ever was, but that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Um, it's fascinating. And you know, you know how nosy I am. Yeah, so no, just let me know then. Tell me what's the most frightening thing you've ever done? The most frightening thing, um, I don't really get scared because in the moment you cannot show any fear. I, I more look back and think, oh God, do you know what I mean? But I do work with, um, I do work with removing demonics. I do work with all the very, very, very dark stuff and shifting that off people. What people don't understand, perhaps, is karma is a very, very powerful energy, and it's an ancestral energy. So what that means is we come here to put right what our ancestors, your, your parents, your grandparents, your great grand, and it can go as far as 20, um, 20 generations, they say. And that's what ascension is. It's releasing all that karmic energy to bring balance back into the world. So what can happen is I work with a lot of people who were sexually abused as children. And a real classic scenario, not to play it down at all, and I actually worked with somebody this week, where they came here and they presented, they were third generation of child sexual abuse in the family. So she was sexually abused by a grandfather. Her mother was sexually abused by... Um, no, her mother was... She was sexually abused by a brother, I think it was. And then her mother is the product of 
her mother having a child with her dad. D does that make sense? And then she came to me because it's passing on and forwards and her son has committed a sex offence as well against a family member. That's a karmic trail. That is a karmic play out until someone does something about that. But that comes from a very dark and demonic. So what can happen is when a child is being sexually abused in whatever scenario, because it's the darkest of dark things that can, one of the darkest dark things that can happen to you as a child, that's when something dark gets in and gets a hold. So yeah, so someone like that, I'm, I've had to release the demonic, which is when I bring the galactics in, and then also release the karmic trail, which is where I bring in again the galactics, and then for the immediate levels, the um, ascended masters. Because it's, it's yeah, can you imagine it? All those years of upset and anguish and negativity and the knock-on effect of that has formed in this physical human being and she or he is here to fix that and sort that or just let it repeat again. Does that make sense? Gosh, that, so that means then that that person who came to you with all of that history and knowing that history, if she did know that it went back that far, she must have been pretty blooming desperate, must she? Was, she yeah, said. yeah. And I did that work for free. I will know, you know. I I get told, <laughs> do this. You need to do this. Even though I knew she hadn't got the money, I don't care. I always say, don't worry about. It. I mean, she begged and begged to pay me. I'm like, no, because I know you've not got it. Don't worry. The universe let the angels pay me. You know, because, and and then I brought my other friend who I co-work with Nat in to do to go into her house as well because. What happens is when someone has such a dark force within them, we get attracted to that without knowing. So, you know, we have abusive partners. I know she wasn't with one now, but she had been in the past. And we had, um, she had, I'd send that in because she had something demonic in the house. It attracts, it attracts. She'd lost both parents in three months. She's lost her children. She's lost this. It's just... The list goes on and on and on because it's created to break you and destroy you so you get, don't get to be a light in this world. Right, let's have a little bit of light now. Yes. Let's have something. <laughs> what is a joyful thing you know you've done? It can be recent or something that really sticks out. Do you know what? I adore working with the teenagers. I really do. So I spe my, my specialty is anxiety. Um, which I see as a spiritual, emotional condition, obviously. Um, but I'm, I'm working with a child at the moment, I say child, I think she's 14, 15, who hasn't gone to school for two, three years through severe anxieties going into secondary school, who since not being at school has been terrified of the... She won't be outside of the house at going into school time or about three o'clock, you know, when the kids come out of school, for fear, though nothing went on, she's adamant nothing went on, but through fear of bumping into the kids from the school. Uh, so she came, had a session with, just one session so far, and she, when she came for the second session this week, she said, I said, How, how's it been? She said, oh, it's been good, I noticed a change. I said, oh yeah, what's that? She said, I went to Matalan and I was... Um, I, did, I wasn't clock watching. I've stopped clock watching all because she lives her life between nine o'clock and three o'clock. I've stopped clock watching. We were out shopping. It was beyond three o'clock and I hadn't even noticed and I was fine. And it's like, so I've given her a life back. There's no way to live, is it? 14. But that's how big moments can become in our mind, isn't it? It's like, so I love all of that. I love working with women and I have I do work with men as well to help them step out of domestic violence and a lot of that after lockdown hard hard discussions and conversations but when they walk out of here and it's like well, I'm about I'm about to do it and then you get the messages that's good I feel good about that so some people watching this might be running businesses or organizations and thinking now how all of that is either I don't believe in it or Ooh. it's irrelevant yeah. to me. Yeah. So how do you help people that run their own business like you do, like I do? Because one of the things that is absolutely key that I've worked out along this path is your mind is everything. It 
creates everything, it attracts everything, it, it dictates, it's the controller, it's what's programmed, if you like, by your life experiences. So if you want a shift in your life or in your business, you've got to have a shift of mindset. So the work that I do is to release what I call negative programming, negative beliefs, negative opinions and views. Most of the time, they're not even our own. They're ones we've bought into so that you can see beyond the block or see what is really holding you back. It's, it's never something external. It's always something internal, whether that's a fear. People have fear of success. People have fear of failure, very similar. Um, and it's just getting the mind to expand beyond what it knows and what it believes so that it trusts you to let you progress and go further because it's only our own mind space that holds us back in doing anything, whether it's winning a race, getting a business deal, expanding, taking premises, taking on staff that aren't your friends, so challenge your comfort zone, that kind of thing. I'm going to finish by asking you one thing. You had quite a big birthday recently. So when you reflect back from being 50 um, to being 28, how do you reflect on your life now? Well, it's not been boring. <laughs> As my kids would say, you're not, you're not a boring mummy. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, I've loved it, but it's been a real, real journey of growth because obviously you have to always be going through a process of personal growth. So I've had to be fast tracking through personal growth, spiritual growth, as well as life. Sometimes you have to go through hard places to learn stuff because if you, your growth doesn't come from everything being a bed of roses, growth comes through challenge. Um, I have loved it. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot. I wouldn't want other people to see. <laughs> But I've had a lot of fun along the way. And here's to the next 50 years. <laughs> Absolutely. So I really hope you enjoyed that. So don't forget to like, subscribe and ring the little bell. And we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.